I don't think we have decided which book next. Right. Uh, in the script, it has a bunch of X's wherein we I have left it blank for us to decide what the heck we're going to read. Three X's. I can play blank. <laughs> yeah, your three X's is my go-to uh, fill-in-the-blank um, way to denote things in writing. So, yep. So, novelization of the movie? <laughs> Uh, so the reason I wasn't sure I was going to finish in time is because I got the version that had David Tennant the from new, Audible. The new one with the the full cast? Yeah, because I was so close and I was just like, I'm going to risk it because I'm not going to buy it twice and I might as well just get the one with the full oh. cast. <laughs> well, you've already read it once, didn't you? At least once. I think maybe even twice. So, cause, so, so, you, yeah, so, you, so, you, so you've already bought it twice now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have the hard. I have the the paperback. Oh, okay. Somewhere. I see. I actually listened to. I was listening to. I think I listened to this book while I was in Europe with my oldest. So I felt very European listening to all those accents while hanging out in England and France. Mm. So anyway, what are we going to read next? Yeah. I comically suggested Three Musketeers. It was mostly because we were talking in French, and I said, hey. <laughs> it, but it is an option. It's, it's, it's a comic slash series. I, 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 uh, I, I already have the Three Musketeers in my library. I listened to, listened to it once. It is a 23 and a half hour audiobook. Uh, so I don't know. You know that, that is oftentimes a, um, a hurdle to, to leap, <laughs> especially for Tracy and I. In a nonfiction, also not on Audible, is Beating the Story the, by Robin E. Lost, which is a sequel to and the Hit Points, which we've done before. So it's nonfiction. Yep. But, so I, there's that. Eric and I had, a, had quite a conversation before you got on. Um, yeah. And so my life is such that I could totally read that, but not by December. I could probably read the, the Robin Laws book like by February <laughs> for, and for that book club. But I got nothing but time for work right now. And an occasional podcast. So should we, do we want to take a longer, like a pause? Well, so that was, that was something too. So it, the next one would be slated for December. We could do our usual and record it mid December. And that's fine. As, as long as we have, I mean, I listen to audiobooks when I'm doing dishes and, and commuting or whatever, so it's not like it takes me extra time at that point. I can get a book in just fine. I just can't read a physical book because I can't do that and drive. Um, right. But so, – so we can do that, uh, but we need to pick a book that I can listen to. Um, but we'd have to do it – we'd have to be able to talk about it mid-December, which is which is fine if that if that works. Or – we skip this one and we don't record a book club until February. Either one. Who's got a preference? Read a Christmas Carol. We could. Charles, Charles Dickens and Christmas Carol? Uh, we could. But I know you're out of credits, right? Is that part of the problem too, Jeff? Um... Well, I am out of credits, but that's not a huge problem. Um, especially, let me check, because it with Audible Plus, it might actually be available. Uh, yeah, so there, there are several versions of A Christmas Carol available for me for free as part of my subscription I could listen to Tim Curry I could listen to Hugh Grant I could listen to a full cast version um, I don't know who Simon Preble is but there's one <laughs> read by him <laughs> so yeah we could, I mean we could do a Christmas Carol that's a short and easy one 
and Christmas Carol is also available on uh, Project Gutenberg because it's public domain. Right. <laughs> so, Which is probably why there's so many versions of it on Audible. Yeah. So you want to do that? I'm good with it if you guys are. Okay. Um, It'll be interesting to, to read A Christmas Carol and um, then have that conversation of, so what's in here for the D&D crowd, right? Because you I well, normally don't think of it like, through that lens. Yeah, kind of like good omens. I mean, with... Yeah. Okay, so December we'll be reading uh, Christmas Carol. Bye. I know there's at least at least one old school uh, adventure where the door knocker talks. Mm. By Charles Dickens. Animated object. Animated object. <laughs> or would it or, or would that be magic mouth? Bye. I feel like, let me go back to my library here. I feel like they, one year, every usually they like give away books and stuff uh, around the holidays on Audible. And I feel like one year there was a different Charles Dickens Christmas story. There's been two. Um, the Cricket on the Hearth. Is also a Christmas story. And what is this? This is a collection of holiday stories they did one year. What was the Dickens one? I thought, cause I thought, I could have sworn there was one that was like this weird, like, um, ghost story, Christmas ghost story thing that I think was Dickens. The Signal Man, have you ever read that one? Yeah, so I mean, I guess a Christmas Carol is also a Christmas ghost story, right? But this is this is I don't know because it's it's a, it's like I think the signal man was like a, like a lighthouse signal man, right? And so it has this almost it almost feels New England Lovecraftian only, of course, Dickens and English. Anyway, from the England back in New England, right? That's right. <laughs> So we'll do a Christmas Carol, and maybe I'll go back and re-listen to those other ones, and I can do it. I mean, they're all short, so I can do a comparison. Sounds good to me. All right. All right. Well, I didn't see if the the chat had any particularly strong feelings. Nope. Nope. I think it's just. Can I be right back and just get a little bit more water from my throat? Uh, fine. I suppose you can have liquids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll just hang out here with Dar Jr. Yeah. Assuming he's still there. You said sound is good. So. The, so impossible to deal with so twitch is weird because it tells me there's two viewers right now but then when i go to the users in chat it shows four names and none of them are dar jr who's the only person who's spoken in the chat so far <laughs> so i don't know who's around and who's not maybe those are the ghosts of christmas past because yeah. i'm technically there i see, so. I see you and me yeah. And then a couple of other folks. So, if you're watching right now, we have just decided what our next book club book is going to be for December. Uh, we are, for the first time, going to go to a real classic, a Victorian classic, right? And read some Charles Dickens and A Christmas Carol, since it'll be in December. Uh, and then Tracy's going to get in some water, because she's had a bit of a cough. And then we're going to get started talking about our 
book club book for this month, month which is uh, Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett's Good Omens. So right now you're getting to see how the sausage is made as we sort of chat about what, we're, what we were going to read next. So it looks like Tracy's back with us. Yes. Welcome back. Woo-hoo. How is your water? That I ever it is water that, that I ever so generously allowed you to have full of full of hydrogen and oxygen. <laughs> yes, is it the hydrogen? The hydrogen monoxide? No. Uh, yes, yeah. hydrogen monoxide. Right on. Make sure that's not in any of your uh, ingredient lists. All right. Well, should we get started? Sure. All right. Let me figure out if I've actually opened my recording software. I have. Yay. Woohoo. It's been a time lately, so. Okay. We are recording and we are streaming and we are all here and there's a script. I'm ready when you are. And I found the script. Nice. All right. Do you, and are you still on? mobile devices or have you found that power cord for your computer i have not found the power cord yet <laughs> so you're, t- you're you've got the script on your phone and the stream going through your ipad yes lovely i'm sure it's gonna be great yeah but i have headphones you do time, yeah so, so sweet <clears throat> this episode of the tome show is brought to you by our patrons you can support the show like they do at patreon.com slash the tome show welcome to the tome book club for october of 2021 the tome is a DD news reviews and interview show and i'm your tome host chasey hurley and i'm jeff greiner in each book club episode we discuss one DD ish related book spoilers be damned in full book club style and our book this time around is good omens by neil gaiman and terry pratchett Ooh, eric's holding up a cover i can i can hold up my copy of the book too <laughs> that's that's my phone. <laughs> and speaking of Eric, with us oh, yeah. as always, Eric Paquette. Uh, hello. Yes. Bonjour. Bonjour. Uh, yes. Always reading a physical book, unlike you guys that where you do the audio. You you have uh, the time and inclination in your life to to monotask and uh, actually like read. And enjoy the the text, the written word. Yes. Whereas I had to listen to large portions of this while walking a dog, so mm. it does not work well. But anyways, we can talk about that <laughs> all later. Um, next episode, which we'll record towards the mid to end of December, we'll be reading a Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Yeah, that'll be a new. Uh, that'll be a change of pace for us. I don't think anyone's ever read that before. No, it's it's a pretty r- rare find. Um, it doesn't come up very often, especially when it's cold out, um, you know, yeah. in December and stuff. It, it almost never um, gets looked at. But but has anybody ever looked at it and read it and discussed it through the lens of being D and D players? That might make us unique. Yes. But- so before we get started on our conversation about Good Omens, I want to say thank you to our patrons that help us pay the bills. Uh, I, so you can – words. You can help too by going to patreon.com slash the Tome Show and offering as little as a dollar per month. You can join such illustrious patrons as Doug Palmer, Gene Crane, Hyperlexic, James D'Alessio, Jill Sanders, Leonard Pelche, Michael Harrison, and others. Now – on to the book. Good Omens by Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman. Uh, we have read a lot of Neil Gaiman at this point, right? Um, mm-hmm. But I don't know, other than, I mean, other than this book, I don't know that I've ever read a Terry Pratchett book before. I've read some two disc world books okay. for so, so I, I read this book and it feels very Neil Gaiman-y to me but then I'm like I don't know if that's actually true or not because I don't have any other Terry Pratchett to compare it to so Wait. 
And I, I think a lot of the Neil Gaiman books we read, at least for book club, were more of the mythology books, right? Yes. Well, yeah, we, were, we read his Norse mythology book. Did we not read? I've read American Gods. We, we read Anansi Boys. And Anansi Boys. Did we read those for the book club? We read Anansi Boys for the book okay. club. And not, the not American Gods. Gods. Yeah. Okay. I thought we did a Discworld, but, but maybe I just read it on my yeah, own. I don't think I've ever read a Discworld. I don't think I own a Discworld book. <laughs> so. Um, and so, and that's and that's the funny thing is because, like, to me, I, I, from the small amount of Terry Pratchett I've done, I feel like there's a lot of play on words, which I know Neil mm-hmm. Gaiman also does to some degree, but the, like, reimagining things that exist but giving them a slight spin, I think... I feel like has been a big part of Discworld, but I, I could be wrong. Give me, give me an example so I can follow what you're talking about. I'm trying to think of a good one. Um, well, I mean, the them okay. versus the actual, like, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Right. Yeah. Bike yeah. riders or motorcycle the mor- riders. Yeah. <laughs> the four bikers of the Apocalypse. <laughs> The reimagining of the four horsemen of the apocalypse feels a lot like Terry Pratchett. Yeah. Okay. So. okay. And I guess subbing in maybe pollution for pestilence because penicillin was invented. <laughs> although, although that, like, I remember the first time I read that book, that made sense. And now, all of a sudden, pestilence is kind of making a comeback these days, right? So maybe maybe pestilence could could still be there when when the horsemen reincarnate next time. Right. And it's also interesting reading this after we read some of the Magnus Chase books, where they're the they're constantly trying to stop Ragnarok, right. which is very similar in some ways. Right. Absolutely. So so yeah, this book this is a book. Um, it is, on its face, I guess, the story of a demon and an angel who were there in the garden at the beginning of time. Um, in fact, the demon was the serpent, uh, and the angel guarded the gates of the garden. Um, and and they've been on earth for so long, they, they've... They've kind of become a little bit human-ish, and they've actually come to become friends. And then all of a sudden they discover, oh, it is as the prophecy has said, and the apocalypse is coming. And But we kind of like it here and don't really want there to be the war that ends all, uh, all of existence. And um, that actually sounds kind of lame. And so let's try to stop it, right? Um, I actually... And, and that's more or less what the story – that's the big the big brush strokes of the story. But yeah. my, my recollection – so I think all of us have read this book at least twice and some of us three times now. Is that accurate? I think so. Yeah. So yes. I've, I've read – this is my second time reading the book and I watched the Amazon Prime series. So if that counts for anything, I've, I've seen that too. Uh, yeah. Uh, I've also seen the Amazon Prime series right. and I've watched the book. I started – the first time I, I I read it was after seeing the Amazon Prime. Uh, I believe myself. I think I watched the series and then read the book in that order as well. Uh, and I read the book in college. Okay. And then saw part of the series, but not all of it yet. Okay. Uh, um, it, it it actually surprised me, I guess, a little bit. Um, the book because I remembered it being more. Um, Crowley and Aziraphale f- focused than it actually was. So I was expecting it to be like 80, 90% them, and, and it's not. It, it spends considerable time with the them and um, um, what's her name? Anathema Device and uh, Newt Pulsifer, Pulsifer and Mr. Shadwell and um, the, the horses, the horsemen of the apocalypse uh, get sort of a little. Um, they get like a little vignette at the beginning of every chapter. Um, Is a FedEx guy just... Well, yeah. The international deliveries or whatever it is, right? Yeah. Not FedEx. 
and and if I, and if I'm not mistaken, it's never really spoken this way, and I don't remember from the the Amazon Prime series, but in my head, it was the same delivery guy in every delivery. From from in my in my head, it was in the book that, and also in the series, it was the same delivery okay. guy. So that he did. He got the job at the start, mm -hmm. and he was doing the whole the, the delivery run, mm -hmm. or basically across the world. <laughs> right, because he's got to make these deliveries to the four horsemen who are all over the world individually, and it's always just like a package, and inside the package is something that symbolizes who they are, and they recognize that as a symbol of oh, the apocalypse is coming. I better go, and they know where to go. Um, yeah. Well, there's one. There's one of the horsemen. The last mm -hmm. one is not on the. <laughs> That's well, or is everywhere on Earth? Yeah, <laughs> right. Because that was the, the the delivery label. So they they find war in I think some African country that was uh, African country that was about to erupt into war. Um, I forget where all of them are. Um, but ultimately, the last one was pollution. That used to be pestilence. In fact, they even make a like the they describe the 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 horseman like signing the delivery uh, invoice or whatever on the clipboard, and and they say you know it, it's it was kind of a scribbled signature. It definitely started with a P and and kind of ended with an uh, uh, estilence or maybe an ocean. Uh, it's really hard to tell. <laughs> no. It's good. no. Kind of implying that it's, that it, sometimes they imply that that, it, that pestilence became pollution, and sometimes they imply that pestilence was replaced by pollution, like it's a different entity. But you know, you're talking about immortal metaphysical beings, so I suppose it's all the same. Yeah. Right. Right. But yeah, shortly after delivering the pestilence, the delivery guy, basically delivered to death, has to basically kill himself. People. Well, has to has to die anyway, right? I think he got hit by a, a car or a truck or something. Sure. Um, yeah. But but it, it, he was confused because he was reading the delivery label and says, "Oh, just one more left. Where does this one go?" Um, it says, "Everywhere." Huh? That's you know. And he was kind of looking at the label and not paying attention. Got hit by a car or whatever, yeah. uh, and died. And that's when death appeared to him and, and took the delivery. So. And then they all head off to Lower Tadfield because they somehow know where to go. They know how this is all going to play out. They know exactly what's going on, which is weird because none of the other forces of the eternal struggle know where to go, right? The, the forces of heaven and hell seem relatively clueless about how this is all going to play out. Uh, and and to the point that they're they're able to be you know tricked and and misled or you know they spend uh, Crowley and Aziraphale their first plan was oh well we know this baby is the Antichrist we're just gonna you know insinuate ourselves into this this kid's life to make sure that he's ne neither good nor evil uh, he'll become a completely neutral kid and then the apocalypse will, ne will never happen. Um, and it turned out that there was a baby switch, uh, you know, just like it was a, a, an episode of Young and the Restless or something, right? Um, and uh, they were they were doing this with the wrong baby the whole time. Uh, and in fact, their correct baby was a kid named Adam in this small town of Lower Tadfield in the UK. Um, but but turned out that hell was wrong too. Like there's all these figures that know what's going on and know where to go, but somehow none of them can be used by heaven or hell to figure out what's happening. <laughs> I, I also just love the picture of the, on the plains is Warlock. So the, the baby they all thought was the, the Antichrist coming. Uh, they, they got the parents to name it Warlock. Right. And they've been trying, like you're saying, like trying to rate, like, all these influencers are on this, and then they bring this kid who is not the antic to the planes to start the war. Right. <laughs> like, wait, something's wrong. Um, uh, Crowley, uh, what's going on right. there? Well, and they they ultimately they knew that that warlock was not the antichrist because the dog didn't show up, the hellhound. Right? There's yeah. there's this whole side story that honestly, like, 
the whole dog thing was really I enjoyed the dog thing. I enjoyed that part of the story. And I but as I think back on it, I'm like if if dog had never been there, it kind of would have been the exact same story. <laughs> like it didn't really add much other than that's how they figured out um, and it was uh, and it was a cute little uh, thing that was that was invented in the story. But the idea was that that there was this hellhound that would be sent up from hell, and it would go to its master, the Antichrist, and the Antichrist would name it, and that would define who and what it would be for the rest of time and how it would serve it. And when when the dog showed up, uh, the hellhound showed up to Adam. He's like, "Oh, look, I've got a new dog, and I'm going to name him Dog." And it just became this sort of mongrel. Uh, mutt of, of a dog that named dog who just became a you know a loyal puppy companion <laughs> so constantly waiting for its master to turn evil except that it didn't really in the end want to turn evil even the dog didn't well because the dog is defined by by its name right so the dog would like like it, it slowly goes from like this is not really what i was meant to be doing and then you get towards the end of the book and it's like i kind of like chasing chasing cats or, or playing catch in the in the yard or whatever like this is all right hell was kind of lame anyway and souls taste boring <laughs> so. oh yeah I, I like the dog also because it, it is a one of the tools they use to show the power over reality mm. that adam has as it goes to lups and it's one of the first clues of, of that. Right, thing. I suppose, yeah. So. So you have an Antichrist who thinks he's a normal kid uh, who has huge amounts of power to bend reality because uh, there's multiple times like he conjures a Tibetan and an alien. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's not clear that he always had that power or if it just sort of the power ramped up as the apocalypse approached. Well, and then, and there, but there was the fact that that specific town, ever since he was born, I think, had perfect weather, mm -hmm. and was a, a perfect paradise for young children, right. uh, and all that other stuff that was happening that ended up getting the uh, what what was the name of it? The witches something. The, the Witchfinder Army. Yeah, the Witchfinder Army finally was like, hey, maybe we should check this place out. Um, <laughs> and you have this great visual of a guy like sitting there with a huge pile of newspapers clipping out things that point to witches because that's what they're supposed to be finding right. and and he's got to try to convince a guy that um, has convinced the uh, Crawley and is it Azafel? Azafel. Azafel, that there's like hundreds of people on the books and it's really just right. him <laughs> In this this army, yeah. So so uh, Shadowell, <laughs> Mister Shadowell is like the last of the Witchfinder army. Uh, he's not even a Witchfinder general. He's he's a sergeant because there's nobody of higher rank to to promote him. Uh, and so and so he'll always just be a sergeant. He's he's and he's clearly this kind of kooky, crazy old man, um, you know, who who sees witches and evil everywhere and and what have you, right? And is a lodger of someone who does. Uh, who's a psychic medium, the seances and other right. activities. Right. Yeah, <laughs> she, Madam Tracy is both a medium and clearly also a sex worker. Right. <laughs> so, mm. uh, and 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 he has strong thoughts about that, and yet somehow he's this curmudgeonly old guy who hates everyone and everything, and thinks that every uh, I, I, I there was a, a point where he talked about how he he really hates southerners and he can he considers himself to be the most northerly point in the world so everybody's a southerner to him you know and yet somehow they describe him as like and yet he's really likable just everybody loves mr shadwell and so madam tracy uh uh you know makes him dinner and leaves it outside and even as he's calling to her and and, and screaming at her that she's the whore of babylon and and whatever but he always she always puts a dinner plate together for him because otherwise he'd never eat right yeah. Uh, and then, and then the the new recruit to the Witchfinder army is is Newt Pulsifer, uh, who um, was working for for some big company or whatever. He was like an accountant and, and just sort of 
was feeling unfulfilled and saw this ad in the newspaper and like showed up and and decided to join the Witchfinder army. As one does. <laughs> I, I mean, I and suppose. And is the descendant of Thou Shalt Not Commit Adultery. Monster, right, and we, we learn. Who, yeah. <laughs> who is that? also the person I think that uh, deals with Agnes Nutter. Right, yeah. The, who has the nice and neat prophecies that kind of, like, push the book along. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a device, which is also funny, because it's Athema. An Athema device is the her descendant. Right. And and they end up kind of getting together by the end. Uh, yeah. Nate and, and Anathema uh, end up becoming a couple, which is ironic, because their ancestors were responsible for, you know, like, Killing each other or whatever. Well, uh, Newt's ancestor was responsible for killing Agnes. I don't think Agnes was killed off. Uh... I th I think he killed Agnes, and then Agnes like she she like li li uh, set up like explosives in her hut or whatever, and he died in one of those. Oh yes, because it was basically like anybody who doesn't who who doesn't follow my instructions or whatever. Um, ends up getting blown up. So, which it's and it's worth noting that that that's actually part of the title of the book. We've been calling it Good Omens, but it is not called Good Omens. It is called Good Omens: The Nice and Accurate Prophecies of Agnes Nutter, which. Yeah. And in this, and they do repeat in the book that "nice" in this case means the old saying, which means exact. Right. Over and over again. In fact, they. Uh, Repeat that information. That no, the, uh, anathema uh, is always correcting somebody. No, but that doesn't mean nice like that. It's nice like exact. It means it means like exact, not like not like we yeah. use it now. And and it, we also find they're not all that exact. It's like it's like somebody remembering a past life uh, with only the limited language of sixteen hundred. Right, and out of order. Like. Right. And, yeah, out of order. And the big problem is interpretation of reading right. and interpreting stuff and all that, which the family of the device family has over the generation has learned and read. And basically, anytime mm -hmm. you learn that she has read mm -hmm. it all of it several times, that even though she has uh, lost the book. I'm on point. Right. I'm, I'm on point. Back to the Nakara of Crowley. Uh, she still is able to. She still knows all the all oh. lines. I and mean, she has an. She has them on note cards, right? Cards. She's got she's got note cards yeah. all over the place, and they've like they the family has over the years found like systems to codify them so that you can sort of figure out when this prophecy seems to be connected to that prophecy, even though they were written years apart from each other or whatever. Right. So in some in some cases in some ways, the prophecies of Agnes Nutter, which drive so much of what happens in the book, because um, it it dictates everything that anathema does and then that intersects heavily with um um newton and and uh, then later madam tracy and shadwell and and everybody else um and and so there's a point where you where you recognize that in some ways they're they're just as flawed as any prophecy right because there are moments where it's like oh this prophecy seems to relate to this situation and it's very clear now but we never understood it we actually thought it was about this other thing that happened 30 years ago right and then there's a lot of moments like that and that's i mean that's every uh, uh prophecy that you've ever seen right it's it's broad and it's yeah. vague and you you apply it to things after the fact because it's not clear ahead of time and yet there still seems to be something to this Agnes Nutter prophecy thing, right? Because um, because she does things like at the now we're skipping way to the end of the book, basically the the epilogue to the book, right? Uh, after it's all over and the prophecies from her original book no longer apply to anything because the apocalypse that she pr was predicting had occurred or not occurred, as the case may be. Um, a, a package arrived to to Anathema's house um, for Newt and and opened it up and and it, it, you know it was another set of prophecies from Agnes Nutter that had been you know 
placed into the care of this lawyer, along with some tips about how to make sure you could build a strong business that would last for centuries. Uh, and, and then there were individual letters inside the box. So occasionally one of the lawyers would get real curious what this thing was they've been holding on to for 300 years. And they'd open it up and there'd be a letter addressed to them. Right. And they'd open up that letter and it would say something really like deep and embarrassing uh, uh, about them. And they'd get freak out and close it and and, and leave it alone. And that happened twice. Uh, so so well, I, I, it also happens a third time because it's not Newt that opens up the oh, box. It's, it's, the, it's the delivery. Yeah, he also see a, a, a letter. On the That's end. true. So it's three times. <laughs> so 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 Agnes, yeah. I'm, there seems to be some legitimate like prophecy going on here. Agnes definitely seems to be seeing something. It is more accurate than what you, we tend to think of as prophecies being. Um, and yet it still falls prey to some of the the same problems that we, we always talk about with prophecy, right? Yeah. Yeah, believe it, my device describes that Agnes looking into the future was like in a big, huge tube and it was where she's only seen a part of it and she's trying to describe mm -hmm. what she sees again based on 1600 uh, uh -huh. so there's stuff that's like she can't understand cars or right. <laughs> computers or whatever so she just describes it to what she sees and <laughs> people have to interpret it but she definitely understands her descendant hooking up with uh, the the witch finder Pulsifer. yeah yes. Newt Pulsifer yeah. <laughs> well, which, which then freaks out Newt, right? Because he's like, wait a minute, does that mean she's seeing us right now? And that doesn't seem okay, <laughs> you know? Uh, well, and it's, and it's even more freaky because people through the, through the centuries have notes like cheering on whoever that's going to right. be. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other descendants were cheering them on. Uh, but but at the same time, like she still interprets that through her own lens, because at the end when that package arrives, it it is for for Mister and Missus. Like she's perceiving it through sixteen what sixteenth century sort of perceptions. It assumes well they hooked up, so they're Mister and Missus. Right. Um, yeah, and and so I think part of the thing is like, of course, this is a book about the. Uh, possible apocalypse and what would happen if the antichrist came but turns out to be just you know raised in your average middle class or whatever family in this perfect town and all that stuff but it's really a book of like these vignettes of deep like the fact that we we don't have that much really but we have this connection with the characters and this like that it's fun to talk about mm -hmm. them because yeah, I mean, uh, all the characters really don't come in together till really the end of the book. When that at the air, at the air the military airfield, that's when all the characters show up. Before that, I mean, yes, uh, uh, I mean you have because uh, like Adam, the, the group known as them, they're pretty much in Canfield by themselves. They interact briefly with uh, any type of the device near the start. Mm -hmm introduced but other than that well and and anathema interacts with newt and newt interacts with madam tracy and mr shadwell um you know and so there's there's this web of and and mr shadwell works for both crowley and aziraphale without without even really realizing it um so yeah. there's this web of connections that connections Brief. Yeah, because uh, uh, and and Crowley gives a gives a lift to Anathema right. to her place, and that's where she drew up. She leaves her the book right. there, which fascinating. and it's worth noting so we've met, we've referenced the them a few times now. Uh, the them is the name of the they called a gang, but it's really just the group. I mean, they're eleven years old. It's really just the group of friends that Adam hangs out with. But but he he is always the ringleader. He is always you know they always do whatever he wants. Uh, he he is responsible for you know entertaining and coming up with things for the group to do because he has this sort of natural charisma, this natural charm, and everybody just defers to him all the time, right? Because he of, he of course is the antichrist. Golden ringlets, right? And I, 
I remember from the first time I read the book, and I don't think it's actually in there, but sometimes I'm just picturing them maybe as slightly younger with, like, their big wheels going around. (laughs) Yeah, that's a little younger than... (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Because, in fact, they go out of their way to describe their their bikes, right? Um, um, The one... I don't even remember the the other names of the them. Winsleydale and Pepper and somebody else. But one of them's got a, a bike that's just constantly covered in mud, and nobody remembers what color it is anymore. And I think it was Winsleydale is the 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 intellectual, I guess, of the group who has the perfectly pristine uh, bike, you know. And so they they everything, of course, sort of fits these these uh, they're they're almost cliche archetypes, I guess. Um, but you, since everything is sort of a vignette anyway, it's useful to have the archetypes because because you're just getting little spots of them here and there. You know, you're not getting uh, full development because there's so many just jumping around to, to these different vignettes. Right, and it's kind of like the so part of the thing at the end is that they get Crowley and and company gets scared because it's like, what if it's no longer about good versus mm. evil, but good and evil versus humans? Um, and what would what would that mm-hmm. look like? Because because that's kind of what happens is that the Antichrist ends up living in this perfect play, like perfect for a kid, and and it, he's considered half human in in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, and he doesn't. The reality is, is he doesn't want it to all burn. Right. He, part of it is that he wants to like try to control it, and, and some, at least at one point, he's just like, "I'm gonna make everything better." Well, and, that, and that's and that's where the perfect. the aliens and the the Tibetan monks came in because he had been reading all these like conspiracy theory magazines and whatever, and and so he he read about Tibetan tunnels, and so he's like, "Yeah, there ought to be." There ought to be Tibetan monks all over the underground just popping up all over the place. And then suddenly they did, right? Or there ought to be UFOs. And so suddenly UFOs showed up. Right. And But the the thing is, is like there's so much – even um, Crowley keeps saying like he can't even invent half the stuff that people just come up with. Right. Uh, in terms of like they, they keep wanting to blame evil. But no, it's really just them. People, people do, do um, it all to themselves, right? Yeah. Oh, and like when they come across the paintball fight at the uh, former hospital in the ruins, mm-hmm. and it's like they turn it into live ammo, which is kind of weird to talk about right now, given some of the new stuff. But uh, and they just make sure that nobody actually gets hurt, but they get to shoot. Nobody stops. And right. Says, hey, maybe I shouldn't be shooting live ammo. At each right. Other. As soon as they it was, it was like a business retreat. Uh, and actually, it was the same company doing the business retreat that Newt worked for. Uh, the, the, right. You got catch by the name of him. They never he never he like he wasn't there or anything. Uh, but it's that company doing like a business retreat, a leadership retreat or whatever, shooting paintball. Um and yeah, and then Crowley turns all the paintball guns into real guns, and then they realize they've got real guns with live ammo, and they just keep going because part of the the story here is that um, you know people are pretty horrible. <laughs> of course, at the same time, people aren't horrible. Like it's people that that stop the apocalypse uh, and right. save the day. And also, even though. The Antichrist was delivered and created by the demons on the demon side. You get to the hills where the on um, on the angel side, they also they also revealed that no, they want that right. too. <laughs> no, the angels so. want the apocalypse. The demons want the because the angels turns out aren't really that good. They don't actually care about humanity. They want to see it all burn because they want, you know, this is the end. It has been written. There's going to be this this big war now, and and we're going to win, and it's going to finally be decided. And and humanity is just the game board uh, that the, that this cosmic battle is taking place on. And and the implication at the end, at least the the argument that um, I don't remember if it was Aziraphale or Crowley. I want to say Aziraphale makes is that like no, I think. It, now, oh, no, it wasn't zero fault because he was talking about the ineffable plan, right? Uh, uh, is that, you know, we talk about how the 
this is the way it's going to be because it's written. And we talk about the ineffable plan. But you don't know that those are the same thing, right? The, the grand plan and the ineffable plan may not be the same thing. It may be the grand plan that God wants all of this to happen, but it may not be the actual plan that he wants it to, to play out that way. Maybe it's really just, maybe he, maybe he's testing us, right? Uh, he wouldn't do that. <laughs> right? Uh so, yeah. Except, except apparently, like that's how things work in their world too. Because Crowley even manages to stave off uh, when a couple of the demons come for him when they find out that he's trying to stop the apocalypse instead of working with them. They come to collect him, uh, and he manages to to get him to hesitate a little bit because he he's also like, oh well, okay, finally you you made it, you passed, you you're 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 good. This, this is actually, uh, you're not a higher ranking demon than me. I'm higher ranking than you. I'm working for, you know, Satan himself or whatever, whatever. Uh, and we, and we were testing you. You don't have to check with me. Go, go talk to the big man. He'll tell you, right? Uh, you know, and, and that was, that was believable enough, uh, that everything is a test and you're constantly being tested and you don't, never really know what your, your betters really want from you, even though they tell you what they want, right? Uh, and that seems to be true all across the board. Well, there's also the fact that for, for for demons, lying is just a standard trait. So, is he telling the truth? Is right. he lying? And which one is it? I mean, that's enough to provide the station they need. So, we talked about it without talking about it the way we normally. Yeah, so we we did not go through the story. We just sort of jumped straight to the end. <laughs> <laughs> Um, which is, I, in, on one hand, I think is is okay too. There is a, because it's vignettes with so many characters. I think if we went through all of the, the sort of beats of the story, it would be a, the conversation would be about half the length of the audiobook. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah, one of the great ones is uh, I forget the other demon or whatever his name, but he gets trapped in the tape. Yeah. From the phone, it was a, the, was the answering fun. machine tape. That was actually the, that was right. That was that same scene, right? He gets him to he he gets. There's two demons. Uh, Crowley gets rid of one of them with uh, holy water that he had saved up for just such an occasion, um, and then pretended that his like plant sprayer uh, was more holy water. But um, the other demons like, well, you know that we can just change reality, right? So he just changed reality so that the sprayer wasn't there anymore and the water spilled out all over Crowley and it was just water. <laughs> um, but then Crowley manages to... to and, and that was actually one of my one of the fun scenes because he, he gets a phone call from Aziraphale. And in the, in the previous scene, we had just seen that exact phone call from Aziraphale's point of view. Um, and uh, Crowley uses that situation to... To call himself, right? He has two lines. Right. And he calls him... It kind of like Matrix. Right? Yeah, or um, it's a little bit like, I guess he doesn't do it in the in the movies, but in the comics, Ant-Man or, or the Atom from DC shrinks themselves... Maybe, I don't know that I've seen Ant-Man do it, but the Atom from DC shrinks himself down so small he's the size of an electron that can travel along the phone lines or whatever, right? Uh, yeah. so, so that's what they do. They, they, they shrink themselves down... Um, to a point that they're traveling along the phone lines and um, at the last minute um, Crowley stops and turns around but the other demon isn't able to stop in time and flies forward and gets stuck in the answering machine tape. Which starts to date the book a little bit, right? Uh, The fact that we are in an age where nobody's running around with cell phones, where answering machines have tapes, um, this tells us a little bit about when it is set because I don't remember them actually giving us a date well it does and doesn't because Crowley and Israfel are both immortal beings so they had stuff for many times and so he could still have one because his his car said that had run out of gas a few decades ago and just been running on fumes well, so running on his willpower yeah I think one of the things that dates it is um the uh, what should we call it? Had a car phone. Is it the the 
ambassador dad. Oh yeah, yeah. Had a car phone and somebody and one of the the demons was like wanted to know how how they had that much line right. wire. Right. So <laughs> so it, it it gives us a what late eighties early nineties sort of time frame for when car phones were around but not really a thing yet. Yeah, I mean it makes sense because Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman were not themselves Agnes Nutter and thus able to. Right. <laughs> it was first published in nineteen ninety. Hey. <clears throat> Yeah. Thirty years. And it makes sense then because I read it in college, which was the late nineties, early aughts. Hold on. So yeah, did we uh, miss any of the any of the characters? I think we hit everybody. The whole the whole thing concludes. We've kind of danced around it, but the whole thing actually concludes at the American Air Force Base near Lower Tadfield, uh, which on its own, like, do we have any Air Force bases in? the uk at this point i don't know if i didn't i guess i did, wouldn't have thought that we did but um but yeah so there's an american air force base there they all sort of coalesce there the, the horsemen know where they're going and they show up there the the them is there um uh, anathema newt madam tracy and and mr shadwell all show up together uh oh with with oh. Aziraphale, With because Aziraphale, Aziraphale has possessed him. Right, Aziraphale's body was destroyed, and so he hopped around the world for a while and eventually ended up uh, possessing Madame Tracy. So Madame Tracy occasionally talks to herself, sometimes in Aziraphale's voice and sometimes in her own voice. Uh, and then Crowley gets there on his own um, through... The wannabe, the wannabe horsemen of the apocalypse do not That's make true. it. <laughs> <laughs> they they were always just sort of an aside joke uh, anyway, right? They were never yeah, because they were bikers. They wanted to know if the the bikers of the apocalypse were real bikers or not. And right. it turns out, and I love the the hell's angels. Right. Well, yeah, because the bikers the, the, the bikers angels, the bikers are like were, were the hell's angels, and the and the horsemen were like, uh, no, we're the hell's angels. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and then. Uh, so they ride along with them, and they decide they're going to be horsemen of the apocalypse too. And so they all come up with ridiculous names of what they're the horsemen of. Um, popular people, or something pop, like yeah, that. popular people, or um, uh, stuff that gets broken and, and can't be fixed, or you know, stu- yeah, uh, things that are basically annoying things. Um, the heck, right? The princes of heck, right? Um, but then ultimately, is it? Is it in the fire where they get lost? So the entire like highway system around London, which Crowley had designed to look like an ancient evil symbol, you know, years ago, he had manipulated um, the municipalities to to make the shape be just right, uh, had burst entirely into flame, and so there was just this, just this giant ring of flame. Um, and I, I want to say the horsemen went through it. The fake horsemen went with them and just, you know. They died on the pile of fish. Oh. Well, three of them died on the pile of fish, I believe. And one of them lived to talk about it, but nobody would believe them that they were following the, the horsemen. The horsemen. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so, and then Crowley makes it through the, the fire and it completely destroys his vintage Bentley, which he holds together by sheer force of his own willpower. The tires aren't even spinning or touching the ground anymore. It's just rims floating over the ground and it's just holding together because he wants it to hold together and he can do that. Uh, and he takes it all the way to the lower Tadfield um, air, airfield as well. They all get to the lower ta- Tadfield airfield by way of some old man walking his dog, giving each of them individually directions at different points in time, right? I, f- I forget his name, but <laughs> the cranky old man who, yeah. who writes uh, complaining letters to the, to the local newspaper all the time. Yeah. And who did they stop the... Uh... The nuclear, like Newt stops the nuclear missiles from being launched by using his uh, skill of anything that is electronics seems to not work in his plan. Right. Yes. Uh, he's so, really bad with electronics despite the fact that he started off in the story like pretending to be a computer engineer or programmer or whatever, like lying about his profession. Um, and then they're like, well, you know, they, they, they've stopped the apocalypse Basically, right? Adam has decided it's not going to happen. He starts setting all everything to rights. The the horsemen 
um, go away. Death unfurls his wings and reveals himself as the angel of death and flies off. And, you know, the, we're not gone. We're immortal entities. We'll, we'll just reform and, and wait until, until it's our time again. Um, the, the, the forces of heaven and hell are sort of held at bay and, and sent back, sent packing or whatever. But it, but ultimately a nuclear war is still going to happen because the, the things have already been set in motion. Uh, and how are they going to stop it? It's a, and, and the airfield is just a communications place. It's not, not really a, you know, the, it's not full of armaments and all that kind of stuff. Um, but n- they're trying to figure out how to stop it. And Newt's like, okay, well, you asked me to, to, to stop it, but it, but it turns out I lied. I'm not really good at computers. In fact, anything I ever touch doesn't work the way it's supposed to. There was one time I bought a what was it? Uh, I bought a a gag circuit once that wasn't supposed to work, and then I put it together and and I was picking up radio stations all of a sudden, and, and I complained to the to the company, and they didn't have any answer for why because it shouldn't have worked right. So it's not even that that everything breaks in his hands. It's just nothing works the way it's supposed to. <laughs> Uh, and so Anathema tells him to, to use the computers and stop the nuclear um, attack. And he, like, I mean, I'm not good at this, but I'll give it a shot. And then he gives it a shot, and of course it all breaks and stops the nuclear war. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Would you like to play a game? Right? <laughs> uh-huh. So, and it's oh, yeah. interesting, like... Adam's situation is interesting at the whole thing too. Like at the end of the story, Adam's like, you know, we're going to go back to the way things were. You're all going to kind of remember that this happened, but you're not going to really remember what happened. So they all know something happened, but they don't really can't recall the details of what happened. And then he goes off and he goes home and he gets punished by his dad. And there was like a moment at one time of, well, well, like I th- what, either Crowley or or Aziraphale, I think, said, wouldn't it be interesting if he, like, in the process of that, gave up all of his powers and stuff too? But we don't actually have any indication that he did. It seems like he's just he's he may very well just be this this godlike, powerful kid, eleven year old, who wants to have a normal life. So when mom and dad punish him, he 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 just gets punished, you know, <laughs> because that's what normal life should be. Well, we know he has some powers because he's able to make the hole in the the um, hedge for oh, the dog right. to get through. Yeah, because he was trying to get the dog to run away, so he have an excuse to break his punishment and, and run off after it. Yeah, because he's just chasing the dog that's running right. away. He's not breaking, uh, you know, leaving. Cur- not it's not curfew, but he's grounded. Right. Basically, he's not yeah. supposed, he's to, supposed to be garden. working in the garden. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, and, and ultimately this this ties a little bit. So um, it turns out, you know, this has been popular enough that BBC did a radio drama of it and there's multiple incarnations of, of the book. And then, as we've mentioned, it was turned into an Amazon Prime series. Uh, and they've also recently announced that they're doing a season two of the Amazon Prime series, uh, which is of particular interest... Hi, Freddie. But yeah, uh, so yeah, there's a season two of the Amazon Prime series that is in the works, um, which is interesting because there isn't another book. Uh, And as I understand it from seeing some interviews, um, Gaiman and Pratchett actually wrote the ideas, the outline, whatever, of a second book. Uh, but then ultimately, like, both of them were successful enough individually that they never quite got around to coming back together and doing it. Uh, like, like life just got a, a hold of them and they were busy uh, and they never wrote the second book. But, like, they still have those notes. And as I understand it, that's what the second season is going to be based off of, is these notes of a book that was never written. So I'll be curious yep. to see if that involves... Um, Adam at all again since he still has the powers of the Antichrist. Oh, yeah. Because, yes, I mean, I, I, if I remember correctly, at the end, too, in that package also includes the second volume of Agnes Nutter's 
prophecies. Right, but I thought they were because they were didn't want to be tied to this obsession of Agnes Nutter's prophecies anymore. I thought they burned the book. Do I remember, am I remembering that wrong? I thought they destroyed it because they didn't they didn't yeah. want to deal with the prophecies anymore. But maybe I'm remembering wrong. Yeah. I can't remember, but I don't blame them. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And also, if, 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 they, if, if they did destroy it, I guess they might have seen that right. they destroyed it. There's only a second book somewhere else. So, <laughs> no, I mean, absolutely. There's ways to go around that part, which we'll see. They're absolutely, yeah, we'll have to see what happens. Um, ultimately, I think, you know, I think the fans would be upset if it didn't include Aziraphale and Crowley played by uh, the same actors because that was the brilliant shining star of the series. Yeah. I believe they started filming and they've seen pictures and then both of those characters are, are back. Yeah. So. so. Right on. So I'm... So do we want to... Oh, go ahead. Oh, you can go ahead. No, because I was going to ask a sort of a wrap-up question. So so what did you want to say? I think that's what I was telling oh, okay. you. I was saying, like, do we want to talk about what D&D players can get out of it? That's what I was going to ask! <laughs> so, that's a lot. Both of you think it correct. Think yeah, so I was... Gonna, I, that was a, yeah, so... This is not, on its face, a typical fantasy story. It is definitely not, on its face, uh, a D&D story. But we are reading this with the idea in mind of, of it being something that D&D players might be interested in. Um, what do you think? Of, of all of the settings that exist in D&D, in classical settings they have, I think for this book, the best setting would be well, would be involved in Planescape because you have your demons, you have your angel, you have Adam who has what he believes to be true mm -hmm. becomes reality, which is a very big aspect in Planescape setting. So you can, those elements exist okay. in that setting and you could evoke certain aspects of right. good Ad Adam good. in Planescape is just a character who normally it takes a lot of belief to change reality but but Adam's mm -hmm. belief is just so strong he can change reality all on his own so, um, yeah yeah well there is a uh, there is a faction in Planescape the uh, sign of one the sign of who had remember had been part of that faction you get an, a Mechanic ability to be able, I believe I put this this happen and you make a roll if you succeed. Yes, that happened. So, so I would see Adam being have that mechanic in play. Yeah, but, uh, I can see that. I, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. And for me, um, I like my games to have a lot of that gray area, and I I love wordplay. So. Yeah. Uh, both of those really um, it, it reminds me of the type of games I like to play like, or at least the type of sessions I like to play where um, you play a little bit with people's expectations mm -hmm. you you know, do a lot of things where the words, words can have multiple meanings or, and, and things like that and I definitely like gray so um, you're not going to have a lot of uh, you're going to have a lot more moral ambiguity than this is like, like black black and white, or stark contrast. Right. There, there is not a lot of... Um, it would be hard to define the traditional uh, uh, grid of nine alignments in this in this story, right? Because as, as we discussed earlier, it's not really about the conflict between good and evil. It's the conflict of good and evil versus humanity. Yeah. Right. Although it is interesting because you do kind of have some of that um, archetypes that you might have in a D and D type campaign in, um, like, Asthma device, Anathema device, and uh, uh, what's his name again? Newt. Pers Newt Pulsifer. So, Pulsifer, yeah. Yeah. Because he's all, almost lawful stupid. Right. <laughs> for a little bit. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, if anything, and I'll say because when we were talking, when you were, when Eric was talking about this, could be sort of the the outline uh, of a Planescape game. I was starting to think, okay, so like, are are players playing Aziraphale and Crowley and Adam and whatever? And I'm like, not 
really, I think that now that Tracy was just talking, I think the party is actually Anathema Device, Newt Pulsifer, Mr. Yep. Shadwell, and Madam Tracy. I think that's the yep. player of PCs. Yeah. I would say that Mr. Shadwell is probably a fighter. <laughs> I mean, I would actually see see another advice would possibly be be a rogue with an expertise in history. Okay. Yeah, I mean, she's so. she's the actual witch, right? So. Yeah. And she does talk about how she's. Uh, is it she's psychic? She actually has some psychic abilities or whatever. Um, we don't really see them come into play, but she mentions them. But the only one we've seen play with actual powers of those four is Madame Tracy when she gets possessed by Azra. Well, she ch- and, and I mean, what was it Azra Phil? Or is it, or, or right, that, I, one could argue that that wasn't that had nothing to do with her and everything to do with Azra Phil, but yeah. What do you mean? She totally. Uh, was a, a medium for those other spirits in the past that it, it, you know the husband always said it was great right here. it was super super clear throughout the whole thing that she was a, a, a she was a, a scammer right <laughs> um you know because she they even talked about how um she always you you know there's always sort of a uh, a spirit guide that um that she uses to be the the medium between herself and the spirits that she's trying to contact and uh you know english people it's always got to be some some wise native american and so uh it was it was geronimo and it became clear uh there was a moment where they described it and it was clear that she didn't actually know anything about geronimo (laughs) other than the name right uh so yeah, no, I mean they go out of their way to describe how much uh, that she's just scamming people um, and telling them what they want to hear, except for this one instance where Aziraphale shows Aziraphale shows up, and then the the husband, the spirit of the husband was actually there, and Madame Tracy was always like, just I'm just gonna tell her what she wants to hear, right? Um, and then um, Aziraphale's there, and and. You know, points out that the spirit is actually here, and and he wants to say something, uh, and what he wants to tell his wife is is shut up, you know, and and she goes, to, she immediately goes to this to the standard like, oh, 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 watch, be careful of your heart condition, don't get riled up. He's like, I don't have a heart, I'm dead. <laughs> shut up. Great. And these are all like great vignettes of things mm-hmm. like. We'd like to have it. I mean, at least I would like to have it at the table sometimes. Like, you sorts of, like, picking up on those right. cues and just I, making it fun. I could actually see, now that, you know, if, in a, if we go outside of the, the realm of D&D a little bit, I could actually see telling this story with a different system like Fate or something where you're actually doing the vignettes and everybody's playing a different character and we're going to okay let's now let's spend 5 minutes right now Crowley what's going on with you okay now, now let's pop over here and uh Newt's heading north to to Lower Tadfield and he's just met an anathema device let's let's play that you know you two are playing those yep. you know so I could see playing it out in fate and yep. just doing the actual vignettes popping around and and checking in with different yep. people Good omens would be a, a wonderful fiasco. Place. Fiasco, yeah. <laughs> it kind, of, yeah, it kind of would. We're we're we a bunch of people are trying to do stuff and everything's falling apart. That's, that's except, of course, in the end of a fiasco, uh, it, it almost always ends in a fiasco. Whereas this this yeah. actually has a happy ending. <laughs> so. Well, wait, does it truly have a happy ending if Adam can't go to the circus? <laughs> Good point. Well, relatively happy compared to the apocalypse. <laughs> All right. Any, any other thoughts about uh, how why this book might be of interest to the, to the gaming crowd? I mean... Uh, we talked about a, a bit of, about prophecy for games because in games you can use prophecy and mm. it's not always using it as written as you have to interpret it mm-hmm. and stuff mm-hmm. might be interpreted wrong and what's new to maintain and you can have different groups interpret the, the prophecy different right. ways and that can be a source of 
I kind of I kind of like the idea. Like I'm, you know, in a D and D setting, it's hard to like do the Agnes Nutter thing where they're interpreting things from their point of view because it turns out technology and like even magic or whatever doesn't really change over thousands of years in D and D settings typically. But if you went to like, you know. Go real ancient, you know, when the world was new and there was a set of prophecies that the players, you know, get a hold of or whatever. Uh, I and I always like as a DM, it's a, it's always a fun little creative challenge to be like, here's some prophecies, and then they're chewing on it and they're figuring out. And, and honestly, I don't know what it means, uh, but I can figure that out as I go, and that gives me some some guidance of some things that I could do or think about or, or push my creativity. Is okay now? How am I going to interpret? You know that they're talking about how they're going to interpret it. Maybe they're right, or maybe they're just a little bit wrong. You know, uh, and I'm going to do something else yeah. with it and find some creativity with it. So, yeah. So I, I have done a prophecy for the Lord of the Rings game where they were was a reclamation of Moria. Oh, yeah. And there was a Corbin prophecy where during the seven would be born, the seven clans will be reunited, and Mario will be reclaimed. And my interpretation of it was like, okay, those are just signs, but doesn't like during the seven being born doesn't necessarily mean he's the one who's going to do, do all, all of it, it, right? So and so there was different. They all may be unrelated things. And what does reuniting really mean? In, reunited in death because they were all destroyed? Who knows, right? Exactly. So there was a different faction for that game for that. So, yes, prophecies can be interpreted. Have fun with it right. in your game, and see what see where it, see where it goes. Yeah. And, and there have been adventures or modules in the past that have tried to re envision our world through. Oh yeah. That sort of long term yeah. lens, which is another way of doing yep. it. Yeah, I, my my uh, last North Carolina campaign was uh, my post-apocalyptic fantasy Earth uh, game. Um, mm. So there was a lot of like, okay, well now you're in what used to be Germany, you know, and and here's the thing that's going on. And most of the campaign took place in the Pacific, and there was there was a, a city that was built inside the old rusting uh, wreck of a of an aircraft carrier, you know, and, and that kind of stuff. So. Right on. Okay, so should we go ahead and call that the end of our episode? Then I think it's time sure. to say goodbye. I want to say thank you to our patrons at patreon.com slash the Tome Show. I just need to get the script. Tracy again. doesn't have her script handy. I surprised her with a conclusion. Uh, <laughs> 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 Uh, to be continued. So, right. And if you'd like to contact us, you can email us the tome show at gmail.com. You can find me at Sarah Dark Magic, Sarah with an H, and SarahDarkMagic.com. Find Jeff on Twitter at Squatch, S Q U A C H. Eric, where can find where can folks find you? You can find me on Twitter easily at Eric M. Pack, E R I C M P A Q. And the show is at the tome show. On Twitter, and you can also find us on Facebook, Patreon, and Discord. You can watch us live as we record the episode on twitch.tv slash tomeshow, or watch the video after the fact on the Tome Show's YouTube channel. Show notes and other great shows are at thetomeshow.com. So that is our thoughts on Good Omens, the nice and accurate prophecies of Agnes Nutter, which, did I get it right off the top of my head? We did. Yes. All right. Next up in... Totally what will be the end of December and not middle of December because nothing is going on at the end of December that would get in the way. Uh, we will be reading the totally thematically inappropriate A Christmas Carol uh, by Charles Dickens. And uh, as much as it was interesting to find the d and ness of Good Omens, um, I am particularly looking forward to figuring out the d and ness of A Christmas Carol because as much as I've read it many, many times, um, I've never thought of, it, thought of it through the lens of D&D. So that'll be fun. Until then, uh, keep toning... Until then, keep turning the page, Tomites. And that's the end of the episode. I will stop the recording. Tricky. A clown or? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I tr- I tried. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yes, it is nice. It is relaxing. Yes, and that's what it needs. That to is be. absolutely <laughs> what it needs to be. This is book club. Good omens. Ooh, good om. I started meditating. My keyboard started meditating halfway through. It's a good om. Oh. <laughs> All right. So that is ready to go. I, I'm not sure if the last book club came out yet. Um, I know as much as my life is stressful at the moment, I believe Sam's is also a bit hectic. So editing yeah. has been difficult. He's got he's got had a. I think they lost a faculty position, I remember, like right before the semester started. And so he was given an extra class like the week before classes began. <laughs> so I can, I can imagine things are rough. So, yeah. Well, I'm going to uh, turn off the stream. So say goodbye to the stream. Good stream.